Okay, it looks like everybody has finished uh, praying, so we will go ahead and I'll say just a quick prayer and we will get started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us the opportunity to be here. Uh, we were not necessarily sure we were going to be able to do this with the, the weather, but thank you mercifully for allowing it to warm up and getting the roads cleared up for us to be able to do this. Lord, we just ask that you empty us of ourselves, fill us with your spirit, Lord. Um, let us give our hearts to you and so that we may finally go home in paradise, Lord, and leave by this uh, sinful world. Just lead and guide us, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this presentation, what we're wanting to do during this week of prayer is really look at the time of the end, but specifically the present day forward to Christ's return, and obviously we know that there's a new earth. Now, we also know that there is a close of probation, part of the sanctuary message, and that in between the close of probation and Christ returning is the seven last plagues. But there's a lot of other things that fill in in between there, and we want to be able to look at that through this week of prayer and find out from the spirit of prophecy and from the Bible what does it say about where we're at and what can we look forward to in the future and what are the things that we can see and what are things we can do to maybe help ourselves. But before we look at the future, we have to figure out where we're at today. And to do that, uh, we have to deal with a subject that there is some debate about within the church. And that is when to leave the cities. So there's really two sides of this debate. One is the warning to leave the cities was given in the end of 1888. You might as well call it 1889 when there was a failed Sunday law by a national reform movement along with a government uh, a uh, congressman named Blair, he tried to attempt to pass a Sunday law, it, a national Sunday law. It ultimately failed, but the group that thinks that, they believe that that was the sign to leave the large cities. Then on the other side of the table is a group that says, no, wait, it is a actually passed Sunday law. When, was, when, the, when the government passes a national Sunday law, that is the time when we need to leave the cities. And so, depending on how you look at that really dictates a lot of the things that you do right now. So, what we want to do is we want to dig into that subject and see what the Spirit of Prophecy says about this and go from there. Now, to do that, we have to look at the destruction of Jerusalem because the quote that's debated is referencing the destruction of Jerusalem. And so, if we look at that, it says... In Matthew 24, 15 and 16, it says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Luke well, continues that and says, And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. A little bit more clear language there. Great controversy goes a little step further. Page 26, it says, When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up on holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside of the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. Now, this is a very famous prophecy of Christ about the destruction of Jerusalem. And it actually goes a step further than just predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. Because notice what it says. It says, when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies, that's the sign to leave, right? Well, can you leave when you're surrounded by armies? No, it, that kind of defeats the purpose. So he's also predicted here that the first attempt at, the, at destroying Jerusalem was going to fail because they were going to be able to escape. And so... What happened in Jerusalem is exactly that. The Jews began to revolt against the Romans. The Roman army came and surrounded Jerusalem. They eventually broke off that siege, and the Jews pursued the Romans as they left, and the Christians fled. About three and a half years later, the Romans come back, and Jerusalem is destroyed, and it was 
pretty much if you were in the city at that time, you, you were killed. Uh, one historian that was there at the time said that the crosses were so close together, you could hardly walk in between them because the Romans just basically crucified everybody that they, that they came across. So this is a very terrible time in the history, but you need to understand it. There was two stages to it. There was a initial siege, and then there was the, the other siege. Now, with that background of how Jerusalem was destroyed, we can look at the actual quote that is in dispute. It says, as the siege of Jerusalem by Roman armies was the signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities, preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes in secluded places among the mountains. So there's really two stages to this quote. And let's deal with the second stage first, which is it will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones. So this warning is about specifically leaving the large cities preparatory, meaning you're still okay in the small cities, but at some point you will eventually leave those to secluded places among the mountains. So this warning is specifically dealing with large cities. And when you look at, now if you look at the first part of this, It says there's an assumption of power on the part of our nation. What does that mean? If I'm looking at these two sides, an assumption of power would absolutely mean passing a Sunday law. You're definitely assuming power there. On on the other side of the equation is a failed Sunday law, an assumption of power. That's the question you have to ask yourself. You could see it that way, and you could also say it's not. And then there's also this other part of this line, the decree. It sounds kind of present tense. It sounds like something that really exists. And so that leads more credence over here. And you're just not sure, is the decree, you're speaking kind of present tense, do you mean a failed Sunday law? This was written in 1885, by the way. So this is before uh, the actual national attempt at a Sunday law. Just keep that in mind as well. So what we want to do, if we were just looking at this alone, for me... I would probably lean more on this side of the fence and say, well, it it's, it's, sounds more like a past Sunday law. If I'm just balancing it out, it could mean this, but I don't know. But then we want to look at other things that she says. And here in, uh, in Country Living, she says, the Protestant world has set up an idle Sabbath in the place of where God's Sabbath should be. And they are treading in the footsteps of the papacy. For this reason, I see the necessity of the people of God of moving out of the cities into retired country places where they may cultivate the land and raise their own produce. Thus, they may bring their their children up with simple, uh, simple, helpful habits. I see the necessity to make haste for all things uh, ready for this crisis. And if you notice, it says, oh, let me go back. Oh, maybe... There we go. Okay. It says, the Protestant world has set up an idle an idle Sabbath there, which sounds very similar to the language in the previous quote about a, a, uh, a Sunday law being set up. But then it also says, for this reason, I see the necessity of God's people moving out of the cities. And this was written in 1897. So this starts to build a little confusion, right? Because it sounds a little different than what we read before if we're taking it to mean a past Sunday law. And we want to be able to balance these things off. Just like in scripture where you can read in the Bible two different scriptures and sometimes they seem in conflict. When you begin to study, you realize the conflict was really with your understanding of it. All scripture works together. It's the same thing with the spirit of prophecy. So if they seem to be in conflict, we have to continue to dig deeper so that we can fully understand what she is saying. Okay, here it says, we must show the world that we recognize in the events that are now taking place in connection with the national reform movement, that's the movement that pushed for a national Sunday law, the fulfillment of prophecy. That which we have for the last 30 or 40 years proclaimed would come is now here. And the trumpet of every watchman upon the walls of Zion should raise the alarm. So this was written, if you notice, January 1, 1889. This is immediately after the failed Sunday law. 
okay? And notice what she says. One, she says, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. That's interesting. But then she also gives us this imagery down here where she says, the trumpet on every watchman upon the walls of Zion should raise alarms. Well, that sounds a lot like the warning given. Zion, another word for Jerusalem, uh, trumpet of every watchman uh, sounding the alarm. That's exactly what would happen as the Romans approached the city. So you're getting that same imagery going on here. There we go. And then here, she says, this is in Manuscripts Releases, Volume 10, 275. The pressure of the Sunday law has come and is coming. We can see that which we have been talking about for the last 35 years, this, Sunday, this law causing Sunday to be exalted, making human inventions take the place of God's holy day, is now being fulfilled. And special note to that line there, has come and is coming. Doesn't that sound, again, very similar to what happened in Jerusalem? There was an initial siege, but it failed, and then ultimately the destruction took place. And she says it here. The decree enforcing worship of this day is to go forth to all the world. In a limited degree, it has already gone forth. In several places, the civil power is speaking with the voice of a dragon, just as the heathen king spoke to the Hebrew captives. Signs of the Times, May 6, 1897. And again, you have that same two-stage similarity to what actually happened to Jerusalem. So it's very interesting. It doesn't prove a point, but it does start to make you question, okay, am I reading this stuff correctly? So we got to go back to that original quote that's in dispute, and we want to focus right here on assumption of power. What is that? Well, we want to let her speak for herself, and she uses that term one other time, and it is, oh, there it goes. There we go. Right here it says, but there must be no assumption of power on the part of God's chosen people. Now, I stopped it there. The sentence, the, the rest of it continues on. So there's no break in this. It's just a period in another sentence. But whatever this assumption of power is, we shouldn't do it. And all right, let's try it this way. There we go. And those who take their orders from Christ must not seek to compel others to obey the law of Jehovah. So seeking to compel is, the assumption, is an assumption of power. So when I look at the Sunday law debate and I look over here, well, most certainly if you pass a law, you are absolutely seeking to compel. But if you're attempting to pass a law, you're also seeking to compel. So now that I have a little bit, maybe a better definition or a clearer idea of this, I can start to see seeking to a, a assumption of power can really do apply to both sides. There we go. All right, so we're now we're looking at, again, that same quote, and we're wanting to focus in on the decree, because, again, it sounds very present tense. In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people to give them a message to bear. He called them to expose the wickedness of man of sin, who has made the Sunday law a distinctive power who has thought to change times and laws and to oppress the people of God who stand firmly to honor him by keeping the only true Sabbath, the Sabbath of creation as holy unto the Lord. So here she is in 1903 talking about the Sunday law. There is no Sunday law in the books at this point in time. And then she says it again in 1906. We should now be doing our very best to defeat this Sunday law. No Sunday law in the books. The best way to do this is to lift up the law of God, and make it stand forth in all its sacredness. This must be done if truth triumphs. So again, we have other examples of her using the same language to, uh, of, of present tense Sunday law, even though there is not a Sunday law on the books. 
All right, so now we're going back to that original quote, and it would be nice. What we're going to focus in on is that part where it says, it will then be time. Okay? And it would be really nice if she would just come out and say, it's, the time has actually come. And you know what? She actually does. She says, the time has come. When God opens the way, families should move out of the cities. The children should be taken from the country. The parents should get a suitable place as their means allow. So she goes ahead and says it at that point in time, which starts to create this balance of when we're looking at these two sides, which side should we look at? It also says here in Manuscripts Release, Volume 7, page 85, in the future, the cities will certainly feel the terrible results of earthquakes and fires. Cities will be destroyed by flood and by lightning. Out of the cities is my message at this time. So here she is uh, giving us a warning to get out of the cities specifically because of the dangers of destruction that will happen at the end of time. So this really starts to create a problem if you are waiting or thinking, okay, I can wait in the large cities until after the Sunday law to leave these large cities. Because if destruction and all this stuff is going to take place before, then you're going to put yourself in a really bad position because now you're in a place that is actually destroyed or gotten hit by some disaster. There's no you know, services, uh, you know, food, water. I mean, we've seen that a little bit here in Texas with this ice storm or the snow that came in where everything got completely cleaned out and people were suffering with cold and all those things. Imagine being in a large city when something more catastrophic happens. All right. So notice what she says here. This is Patriarchs and Prophets 166. Before the destruction of Sodom, God sent a message to Lot, escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in the plain, escape to the mountains, lest thou be consumed. The same voice of warning was heard by the disciples of Christ before the destruction. When ye shall see the Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. They must not tarry to secure anything uh, from their possessions, but must take the most of the opportunity to escape. There is a coming out, a decided separation from the wicked, an escape for life. So it was in the days of Noah, so with, so with Lot, so with the disciples prior to destruction of Jerusalem, and so it will be in the last days. Again, the voice of God is heard in a message of warning, bidding his people to separate themselves from the prevailing iniquity. So notice what happens here. She says the same voice uh, of warning that was heard by the disciples uh, was the same voice that Lot heard. And then she connects it again with Noah. So you have Noah, the voice that warned Noah, the voice that warned Lot, and the voice that warned the disciples of the destruction of Jerusalem will eventually, at the end of time, in the last days, give us the same warning. Okay? And, and ironically, not ironically enough, those are three examples used in the Bible to describe the end of time. Well, notice what she says here. I could not sleep past two o'clock in this morning. During the night season, I was in council. I was pleading with some families to avail themselves of God's appointed means and get away from the cities to save their children. Some were loitering, making no determined efforts. The angels of mercy hurried Lot and his wife and daughters by taking hold of their hands. Had Lot hastened as the Lord desired him to, his wife would not become a pillar of salt. Lot had too much of the lingering spirit. Let us not be like him. The same voice that warned Lot to leave Sodom bids us come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean. Those who obey this warning will find refuge. Let every man uh, be, what made, be wide awake for himself and try to save his family. Let him gird himself for the work. God will reveal from point to point what to do next. So notice what she says. The context of this conversation is about getting out of the cities. And she says, the exact same voice that warned Lot to leave Sodom bids us come out from among them and be ye separate. And the same voice that warned Lot was the same voice that warned who? Noah. The same voice that warned Noah was also the voice that warned the disciples in Jerusalem. So the same voice that she says at the end of time is going to warn us to get out of the cities or to separate, she's saying already happened. 
We're all ready to be separated. Now, this, again, creates a massive problem if you are in this camp and you're reading that original quote that we went through in the light of, okay, when the Sunday law is actually passed, that's when I need to get, that's when I need to get out of the large cities. I want to emphasize large cities. But if you're on this side, this is no problem. The warning was already given. This flows completely and has no issues there. There we go. Men in responsible positions will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but from the sacred desk will urge upon the people the observance of the first day of the week. Pleading tradition and custom in behalf of this man-made institution, they will point to the calamities on land and to sea, to the storms of wind, the floods, the earthquakes, the destruction by fire, as judgments indicating God's displeasure because Sunday is not sacredly observed. Now, this is a very powerful quote it's found in Christian Services, page 155, and on the surface, it doesn't seem to really deal with this subject, but I want you to notice something here. There is lots of destruction going on. You got floods, earthquakes, judgment, destruction by fire, judgments indicating God's displeasure, but they're, they're squarely putting it, these disasters, they're squarely laying it on God's doorstep saying they are judgments of God because Sunday is not sacredly observed. And then here, this is Review and Herald, September 17th, 1901. Storm and tempest, war and bloodshed. In these things he, being Satan, delights. And thus he gathers in his harvest. And so completely will men be deceived by him that they will declare that these calamities are the result of the desecration of the first day of the week. From the pulpits of the popular churches will be heard the statement of that the world is being punished because Sunday is not honored as it should be. And it will require no great stretch of the imagination for men to believe this, for they are guided by the enemy and therefore reach conclusions that are entirely false. So this sounds very similar to the previous quote, except it adds a little bit. One, you've got storm and tempest, that's natural disasters. And then you've got war and bloodshed, that's man-made disasters. But also something very important. It gives us the answer as to why they blame us for the destruction. They blame us for the destruction because... Men were deceived by Satan. So they're actually deceived by Satan into thinking that these destructions that fill the land are the result of Sunday breaking. And so let's look at, if this will go forward, there we go. There we go. Last day events, page 129, Satan puts his interpretations on events. And they think, as he would have them, that the calamities which fill the land are the result of Sunday breaking. Thinking to appease the wrath of God, these influential men make laws enforcing Sunday observance. So notice what happens here. You've got a cadence here. Satan puts his interpretations on events. How does he do that? We saw that from the previous quote, because they're deceived, right? They're deceived. And then the calamities which fill the land, that gives us an idea of the, 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 the amount of destruction that's going on, this is global and catastrophic, are the result of Sunday breaking. And to appease the wrath of God, they make laws enforcing Sunday observance. So the Sunday laws happen when, before or after the destruction. It happens after. It's the destruction that happens. Matter of fact, you have actually two things here. If you're, if you're watching it, you have two things going on. You have destruction taking place, but you also have deception, deception from the devil, because that's how this is all happening. That's how you get blamed. And you may never have seen this before, and you may not have thought of it in this way, but I almost guarantee you, you've read this same kind of cadence before. If you look in your Bible, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 and 14, it says, he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven in, on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by the sword and did live. Now, a lot of times I've read this uh, hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, and it didn't dawn on me until I was really studying this subject that this really pertains to it. Because notice what happens. They make an image to the beast. Why are they making an image to the beast? I mean, let's be perfectly clear. If we're looking at the world as it stands right now today, 
most of the world doesn't keep Saturday or Sunday. And of the people that do keep Sunday, they just go to church on Sunday if they go. And the vast majority don't, the absolute vast majority don't take, keep it sacred at all. So something changes to make them actually want to make an image to this beast. And what is it? It's found right here in this verse. They're deceived. They're deceived by Satan into making an image to the beast. But I wanna be also clear because we can, we, can, we can downgrade that deception a little bit to make it mean something generic, like, I mean, the world is deceived by Satan already. It's been deceived since Adam and Eve fell. But this is very specific. It says they're deceived by means of miracles. So when we look at this and we put this in context of the other quotes that we've read, it's clear that what you have is you have destruction taking place on the earth, but you also have miracles that deceive the world. And those miracles are in such a way that it makes us, makes the people of the world believe that it's lack of Sunday sacredness that's the fault, which targets, puts the target squarely on the back of those that keep God's commandments. And if you want to know what miracles are, look up in the Bible. Find all the times when the Bible has miracles being wrought, and you can write them down on a list. And you're probably going to find a lot of the things that, uh, that take place prior to the cities, pr- prior to the Sunday law happening. And so these things are very important because what does that mean for this theory that, okay, we can wait till the large cities happen before I get out of the, before I get out, or wait till the Sunday law happens before I get out of the large cities? It's really problematic, right? Because I've got destruction happening all over the world. I also have, uh, I also have deception. Satan has now deceived the world because they think that it's our fault and they think it because of miracles. Those miracles are wrought by spiritualism, by the way. And we'll go into more of that later. But they're deceived by all those things. And now you're saying that we're going to stay in this large cities until this already has taken place. So one, my city could be hit by one of these uh, destructive events that happens. But also, I've got most of my neighbors that are deceived by Satan. This creates a real problem with people that have this thought process in their mind and they're reading that. Now, if you believe to get out of the cities earlier, the large cities, in 1889, this doesn't create any issues. It's very clean. It's very clear cut. But if you're on this side, it becomes very very problematic. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. So this is very uh, famous uh, Bible verse. This is talking about no buy or sell, definitely related to the Sunday law. But notice what she says in Manuscripts 21, uh, 21 uh, page 90. It says, and again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions for in the future, the problem of buying and selling is a serious one. Well, so first off, I've got this problem again. She says, the Lord is instructing to take our families away from the cities, which again creates a problem if you're on this side of the thought process. But then also... I'm supposed to raise my own provisions because buying and selling will be a serious one. So this is an actual helpful tip to help alleviate some of the problems that are going to happen, the hardships that are going to happen to us at the end of time. What she's saying is, look, if you can make yourself a little more self-sufficient, grow some of your own foods, when you can't buy or sell, that will help alleviate some of this. And if you look at provisions, if you look that up, uh, when she talks about what to do when you're living and doing your own thing, she, what she means is a garden along with, I guess you would call it a small orchard, but it's really a, you know, a few, few fruit trees. You can do most of this on you know, one and a half, two acres of land, no problem. But let's take a look at this because we're trying to determine which side of this argument is correct. Let's look at this quote because this warning has to be valid for us. Eleanor, uh, the spirit of prophecy is not going to write something that's completely pointless to us. So obviously, this is before the buying and selling. You have to already have owned the property and be growing your, pro, uh, your provisions before the buying and selling. Now, if I'm looking at the Sunday law, the most generous I think I have heard in, the, in how the Sunday law happens is 
uh, I've heard it numerous places where there's four stages to the Sunday law. There is a very, very light first stage, which is just don't work on Sunday. There is a, uh, well, you, now you have to go to church on stage two, stage three, no buy, no sell. Stage four is the death decree. We'll not debate that part uh, right now. We'll go ahead and say, okay, we're going to have these light stages. Because obviously if it starts off no buy, no sell, then this blows up this idea right here. But think about it. So first you have to go and you have to, the Sunday law happens. So let's, we'll assume the Sunday law happens under this thought process. Uh, and I'm now supposed to sell my house after the Sunday law, buy property in the country. And if you're in a large city, I've lived in large cities before, you don't have a lot of land and you probably have never gardened beyond hanging up something in one of those little uh, baskets and watered some plant, maybe a tomato plant or something like that. But you're supposed to apparently, after the Sunday law, move into the country, know how to garden, plant trees, because that's one of the things she says, and trees take a while to grow. And that's going to help you during the no buy, no sell. Well, that creates a real big problem unless the Sunday law happens and you have a very long time for for the trees to grow and the harvest to come in and all these things to happen before these other stages take place. It could theoretically happen, even if you get rid of the trees and you're just saying a garden, you still have to grow them. You have to have them grow up. You also have to learn how to can. There's a lot of things that go into it that would be very tight window to be able to do. You could thread that needle, but it becomes very, very problematic. And so it again, hurts that thought process of this. Now, here's something I think is a little, a little more pertinent. It says in volumes 21 of manuscripts release, page 90, the Lord calls his people to locate away from the cities for in such hours you think not, fire and brimstone will be rained down from heaven upon these cities. Proportionate to their sins will be their visitation. When one city is destroyed, let not our people regard this matter as a light affair and think that they may, if favorable opportunity offers, build themselves homes in that same destroyed city. Okay, so now this is really interesting. I could probably talk for an hour about this thing here because there's so much here. But basically the bottom part here, she's saying, look, when a city's destroyed, don't think it as a light affair and that you wanna go and look for housing on the cheap and buy a house and maybe make a little profit or you get more property than what you would normally be able to get because the housing prices are depressed. And we've seen that before, like when Katrina happened in, uh, uh, in New Orleans, you know, people take advantage of this stuff. And she's saying, look, don't do that. Um, but there's a problem with this. If, if I'm looking at this again, it has no problem over here with this thought process of leave, the, leave and live in the country post 1889. But if I'm saying I have to wait and leave the large cities until after the Sunday law, I've created a very big problem for myself. Can someone tell me an Adventist that after the Sunday law is created is going to have thoughts of, yeah, let's go move into the city. Not just any city, which I don't think you'd find an Adventist one that would say, let's go move into the city because we all know that once the Sunday law happens, that really runs the, the line of God coming soon. So you're not going to find an Adventist one that's going to want to move into the city, which makes this very difficult. But it goes even beyond that because it's a destroyed city. That, who's wanting to do that? And then it goes even beyond there because how is it destroyed? Fire and brimstone. That's a unique way of a city being destroyed. I've only heard of that happening one other time. Sodom and Gomorrah. And so you really have a problem if you're in this thought process that I can wait and live in my city until the Sunday law is passed because this makes absolutely no sense in a post-Sunday law environment. No Adventist is going to want to move into a city post-Sunday law. They're certainly not going to want to go move into one that's destroyed and especially by fire and brimstone. I mean, you can think about this stuff. It I can't imagine, if you will, a husband and wife having this conversation. You know, darling, I, you know how we've always wanted that beachfront property? I think we can get a good deal. And then the spouse is like, oh, yeah, you know, but I mean, babe, it was, it was just destroyed by fire and brimstone. And the Sunday laws already happened. And, and the husband's like, 
I know, you look, the Sunday laws happened. Yes, I know we have a very short window here. But, and, and yeah, it's going to smell like sulfur for a while. But I think we can get a really good deal. That creates a whole massive problem. Who is going to do this? No one. No Adventist, because this is written for Adventists, no Adventist is going to be even looking to do this in this time period, especially given the type of destruction that's happening. And there's even more on top of this, because it says, when you think not. Well, again, this is, this is for people that are in the knowledge about what the spirit of prophecy says. Who is going to think not that destruction is going to happen to a city post the Sunday law? I actually think so. It's not a surprise to me. And it wouldn't be a surprise to anyone that's studied any of this that there's going to be disasters. Now, I can't tell you which day or what type of disaster is going to happen, but it's not telling me to predict that. It just says, I think not. Well, I don't. I think so. And every Adventist out there would think the exact same thing. So that creates just this massive wall of evidence that really topples this idea that we can wait to get out of the large cities until the Sunday law is actually passed because you're going to have destruction happening well prior to that, and that can create a big, big problem for you. And this isn't the only place where it mentions this. Testimonies to the Church, volume 9, page 28. I saw an immense ball of fire, that sounds like fire and brimstone, fall among some beautiful mansions, causing their instant destruction. I heard someone say, we knew that the judgments of God were coming upon the earth, but we didn't know that they would come so soon. Others with agonized voices said, you knew? Why then did you not tell us? We did not know. On every side, I heard similar words of reproach. Okay, so this, you have this fire, ball of fire coming down, which kind of sounds like fire and brimstone, but notice what happens. You have two groups of people. One group says, we knew this was going to happen, but we did not expect it. It was way sooner than what we thought. And then the second group says, you knew and you didn't tell us. So the one, one group had no clue. The other group knew, but did not expect it to happen so soon. And then here, and this is actually, we did not have this until 2015. This was actually the final release of all of the manuscripts of, of Ellen White uh, in 2015 were finally released. She actually talked about that exact vision about five or six different times. Each one gives a little bit extra information or different information so you can start to piece it all together. But notice what she says. When I was at Nashville, I had been speaking to the people. And in the night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled in Nashville. There were flames going out like arrows from that ball. Houses were being consumed. Houses were teetering, tottering and falling. Some of our people were standing there. It is just as we expected. They said, we expected this. Others were wringing their hands in agony, crying unto God for mercy. You knew it, they cried. You knew that this was coming and never said a word to warn us. They seemed as though they would almost tear them to pieces to think they had never told them or given them any warning. So this puts an extra piece. So we had two groups in the previous quote, right? We had a group that knew it was going to happen, and, but they didn't know it was going to happen so soon. And we had a group that was warned. Well, we now know from this one, this quote, that it's our people, it was SDAs there. It's SDAs that are going to witness this. And they're saying it's as we expected, but we know from the previous quote, they also didn't expect it to be so soon. They, it was a surprise to them. In another quote, I didn't put it up here uh, just for the sake of time. It's very similar to this. It also says that the, the Adventists were praising God when they saw it because they knew it meant the soon coming of God. So it was our sign of the end, I should say. So when you look at this and you piece all this together, you have fire and brimstone or a big ball of fire, however you want to describe it. You have that coming down upon a city. In this case, Nashville is one of the ones specifically mentioned. So you have this happening. They, these Adventists are apparently knowledgeable enough to know that she's prophesied about this before because they recognize it. And they also said they expected it. So they know these things, but they're surprised. They're surprised again that it happened so soon. Well, how would you be surprised? Only if it's prior to 
other events that we know will happen where we know the end of time is up, i.e. like the Sunday law and you have a lot of spiritualism. We'll get into that stuff later. But if you have a lot of that stuff already happening, guess what? You're not surprised by this. This is no surprise at all. You actually expect it. You don't know what day, but you're not surprised by it at all. So this is something that we know is going to happen and that they're surprised, which again, totally hurts this and also may give us a peek into maybe the first salvo of what destroys the cities initially. Because notice again, we know there's going to be destruction in the land and we know there's a focus on the cities and that's more of a focus for tomorrow's uh, service, but they are, it's a destruction that happens, but this we're still surprised at. So what does that mean? If you have a lot of different cities all over the world get hit by natural disasters, let's say stuff that we're more commonly aware of, like earthquakes and fires and hurricanes and, you know, the fill in the blanks. Once you reach a certain number of those destructions, you expect it, right? Because the, there's so much going on, you, you kind of know something's going on. So this sounds like something that is happening again early in the process of that destruction. And there's yet another example. Manuscripts released, volume 11, page 361. In the night I was, I thought, in a room, but not in my own house. I was in a city where I knew not, and I heard explosion after explosion. I rose up quickly in bed and saw from my window large balls of fire. Sounds very similar. Jetting out were sparks in the forms of arrows. Buildings were being consumed. And in the very minutes, in very few minutes, the entire block of buildings was falling and screeching and mournful groans came distinctly to my ears. I cried out in my raised position to learn what was happening. Where am I? And where is my family circle? Then I awoke, but I could not tell where I was, for I was in another place than home. I said, O oh Lord, where am I? And what shall I do? It was a voice that spoke, be not afraid, nothing shall harm you. I was instructed that destruction had gone forth on the cities. Well, doesn't that sound like an initial thing, the initial start? Hey, look, this is what she saw, and the initial thing is, oh, it just started. Destruction had just gone forth on the cities. It sounds very much, if it was just this, I might not think as much of it, but in light of all the other quotes, it seems to indicate that there will be some sort of fire and brimstone, some large scale of destruction along those lines that initiates this disaster. And we're not to take it as a light, a light matter as that first quote had. We're to take it very seriously. So maybe this is a warning. This, maybe this could be one of the first things that happens. And it gives us Adventists a little bit of time to wake ourselves up. Because we remember with the parable of the 10 virgins, how many are asleep? All. So we're all asleep. Maybe this is what wakes us up and allows us to have a few moments to really think through this and get ourselves prepared for what's to come. Because what happens right when this happens? We've already seen the cadence. You have destruction, but what happens with that destruction? Deception. And that deception is coupled with, is really spiritualism because it says through miracles. So that's what we're looking for that happens. So the question then becomes, what do we do with the cities? Does that mean we just abandon the large cities? Because again, this is a warning specifically for large cities. This is uh, Country Living, page 30. The truth must be spoken. Whether men will hear it or whether men will forbear, the cities are filled with temptation. We should plan our work in such a way as to keep young people as far as possible from this contamination. The cities are to be worked from the outpost, said the messenger of God. Shall not the cities be warned? Yes, not by God's people living in them, but by their visiting them to warn uh, them of the, what is to coming on the earth. So here a messenger of God is giving us this guidance on to how to deal with the cities. And there's numerous reasons not to be in the cities, but it's a specific reason in our time is because of the destruction that's going to take place at some point, and we don't know when. Now, the question you have to ask is, and I've, I've asked this myself numerous times, is, does that mean I have to commute? Yeah, yeah, if you work in a city and you're, or you want to stay working in a city, you're going to have to commute. And it is a sacrifice. 
I understand, I drove an hour and a half each way on average, and I had numerous days that were like four and five hours long because of some random accident on the highway where it turned into a parking lot. But God often asks his servants to sacrifice. Notice what he said to Ezekiel, chapter four, four through 12. Now lie on your left side and place the sins of Israel on yourself. You are to bear their sins for a number of days and you lie on your side. I am requiring you to bear the sins of Israel for 390 days. Uh, one day for each year of their sin. After that, turn over and lie on your right side for 40 days, one day for each year of Judah's sin. Prepare to eat the food as you would barley cakes. While all the people are watching, bake it over a fire using dried human dung as fuel and then eat the bread. Commuting doesn't sound as bad as it it once did to me. That, That sounds really bad. That doesn't sound like anything I really want to have a part of. But then also notice what he said to Hosea. For the Lord first began speaking uh, to Israel through Hosea. When he, or he said to him, go, marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived into prostitution. That does not sound like a recipe for a happy marriage. And commuting doesn't nearly sound as bad as that. So we have to also be thankful and reminding of what God tells us to do. But while the, this message was about when to get out of the cities, I think personally, when I studied this, because I originally actually thought, because I had just read that one quote, I thought it was when there was a, a Sunday law, that's the time to leave the cities, large cities. Um, I thought it was, uh, it, it, you know, this really helped me really see that God was coming soon, which is the overarching message of this. Because if we look at this, what are the three things that are are used in the Bible to talk talk about the time of the end? Well, the flood, how long did Noah preach? 120 years. Then we have Sodom and Gomorrah, which was the same day. And then destruction of Jerusalem was about three and a half years. And our message, our warning that we got in 1889 was to get out of the large cities. And that's 132 years ago. And because it's 132 years ago and not some nebulous time in the future, that tells me that God is very, very close. We could wake up at any moment and have these events start to take place. And that is gives me uh, a lot of joy in knowing that we are at the end and very close to the coming of God. So that is the the end of this presentation. Uh, Tomorrow night will be the reasons why we're going to go into a little more specific what's going to happen in the cities, why should we not live in them, to really drill down, because this I really wanted to set the stage because there is that debate and there is people that, that, that side over here I wanted to really put that to bed because if you really look at these, there's really no other way you can look at these quotes and put it all in the place of happening after a Sunday law. It just doesn't work. And so again, tomorrow will be uh, kind of part two of this part, which is closing out what will happen in the cities. And we're going to do that again at five o'clock, not like the the flyer says, uh, which is six o'clock. Also, I have in, uh, and let me grab one here real quick. I'll jump off camera. I have back here, if anyone would like them, I have, uh, when I started studying this, I really liked to put it in place in context where I could look up all this stuff. So I created this chart of end time events that kind of gives, you know, just how things go and what's going on. And then back behind here is all the quotes that go along with that. And a lot of it's going to be on here, not everything, but a lot of that will be on here. And uh, you're welcome to come get some after the meeting. If you would like one of these, it's fine. Um, But again, tomorrow's meeting, five o'clock. Let's go ahead and bow our, our heads for a closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all your wonderful blessings, Lord. Thank you for again, allowing us to come together and learn your truth, Lord, what you would like us to hear. 
and learn the message that you are coming soon. And there is things that I need to do in my life, Lord. Lead and guide us, Lord. Sometimes we don't know how to give our hearts. Take them anyway so that we can be with you in paradise. In Jesus' name, amen.